If I were to ask you the following question, how many of you could answer it without thinking about it? Okay, in two seconds or less, what's your favorite restaurant? Raise your hand. Favorite restaurant, you could name it in two seconds or less. What's your favorite park? What's your favorite class? What's your favorite street? Nobody. <laughs> One. So, you know, part of uh, the problem that we have in this, in, in this as well as a lot of cities is that we've stopped thinking about streets as public spaces that can really be hearts of our community, can really be community hubs, can be places that are beautiful and beloved, places that are uh, opportunities to make connections, to strengthen neighborhoods. Um, you know, when I lived in, in Seattle, occasionally my husband and I would just, we lived on Queen Anne, and occasionally we would just walk up to Queen Anne Avenue just to see what was happening on the avenue, and we would make fun of people waiting in long lines for Menchie's frozen yogurt in 40 degree weather, and we would uh, people watch, and we would, um, because we were just curious, because that's part of our nature um, as, as human beings. And um, that's the really the opportunity presented by transportation and the opportunity presented by our streets. Um, if you are interested in working on big city, pro big city problems, if you care about sustainability, environmentalism, e economic development, community happiness, resilience, um, you know, uh, water and conservation, uh, obesity, injury prevention, any of those things, you should be in transportation. Um, because that is what transportation in 2015 is really about, and that is what transportation professionals in 2015 are being called on um, to deliver. So I'm going to start with, with uh, not looking ahead, but looking back. So uh, this is actually Hollywood Boulevard. Um, this is around uh, the, the turn of the century. It's, uh, you can see the, the red car line in operation there. You can see it's probably Christmas. There's a lot of decorations up. Um, and you can see that uh, automobiles are, are starting to make, make a show, but then they really arrive on the scene and the street sort of descends into chaos, right? And you can see that there's been a couple of changes to the street, but, but not a lot. So this is the same street. Uh, this is about 10, 10 years or so later, and you can see that um, there are a lot of people on this street, but the way that they're interacting is very chaotic. And a lot of times when you look at pictures like this, you see pictures like this, they invoke a sense of nostalgia. People, I could pull a picture like this from any American city in the, in the 20s and 30s, um, and it would look really similar. Um, but the problem is that, you know, during this time, sort of traffic deaths were at their highest point. Um, you can see that uh, traffic control devices aren't really on the scene in a meaningful way, um, and there's not a lot of organization to the street. Um, and so, you know, in an attempt to sort of deal with that safety issue, uh, we have the arrival of, of something called the myth of perfect separation, which is this idea that if you completely separate people driving from people walking, from people taking transit, um, you can achieve a better outcome. And furthermore, if you so separate land uses, so you, you separate the places where people live from the places where they work, from the places where they play, um, that you can move even further towards that goal. Um, so you can see here, like, the arrival of, like, here's a, a stop sign, sort of the beginnings of kind of trying to traffic engineer the streets. Um, you can see the pedestrians have sort of been relegated um, over to the sidewalks. But this is that same street today. Um, and, and somewhere along the way, uh, we've tried to force the street to be used in a certain way, but people want to use it differently. Um, Hollywood and uh, Highland is actually one of the most dangerous intersections in the city. So in our attempt to sort of completely separate users towards a safety outcome, there's been some unintended consequences. Um, so why is that? You can see that the, the sidewalks are teeming with people. Um, this is a place that you can go and, and it looks probably the most like Manhattan of anywhere in Los Angeles in terms of the pure density of folks on the sidewalk trying to use the street in a different way. These are the main playbooks for how we design our streets, right? And they were really the only playbooks for how we designed our streets. Um, so, you know, here's the Highway Capacity Manual, manu Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. Um, in California, we had uh, the Highway Design Manual and actually the California version 
of the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And part of the issue with these playbooks, uh, particularly the federal ones, is that they must uh, come up with a set of design guidelines that apply from the mountains of Maine to the deserts of Arizona. Um, and when you try to put together design guidelines that apply everywhere, they really apply nowhere. Um, one of the sort of early, my early introductions to the community on the west side of Los Angeles uh, was when I got here and my engineers in a well-intentioned attempt to abide by what's in the manual on uniform traffic control devices went into a neighborhood on the west side and began installing several one-way signs and do not enter signs <coughs> along a, a corridor that was in a neighborhood. The community became unglued. I had my councilman for that district out there actually yanking out the signs himself. Um, it was a huge sort of, uh, it became, a, it was a tempest in a teapot, but it was a big issue for that community because all of a sudden we had quadrupled or quintupled the amount of signs that you would see as you move through their neighborhood. Um, so, you know, these were sort of the, the design guidelines that we had and still have. Um, and the outcomes that we got when using these design guidelines were not necessarily aligned with our community values. So many of the, a, a lot of the goals, particularly uh, if you look at sort of the highway capacity manual, which, which is the main way that we measure the performance of our streets um, from a capacity perspective. So how many vehicles can you move through a given point um, over time? And what's the average driver delay uh, to someone in a car? you end up with these uh, streets that are very fast because if your goal is to move as many drivers as possible and reduce driver delay, then you create the wider your street is, the more successful you are at achieving that outcome, but also the faster the street becomes. Um, and from a sort of vulnerable user and injury prevention perspective, we ended up with some really poor outcomes. You know, this is the chance of uh, fatalities based on the speed of the car traveling um, if it impacts you as a pedestrian. So you can see the huge difference um, in the chances of a fatal outcome between 20 and 40 miles an hour. Um, the other issue that we had is that, uh, you know, in our sort of, this, this over here on the left um, is what could be described as level of service A. And level of service is hopefully a, a tool that is becoming a little bit loosened and maybe goes away entirely in the next year or two. But for now, it's still very powerful. It's, it's the main tool that, that our industry has used to measure and talk about the success of streets and also the benefits and impacts of development. This here is a level of service A, free flowing conditions. Uh, you can see the street is sized to carry uh, thousands of vehicles a day. The signals are very far apart um, to allow drivers to have very minimal sort of friction as they travel through this corridor. But to an economist, this is a terrible street because nobody is slowing down to stop and smell the roses to see what's on the side of the street. Um, and in fact, the top five commercial districts in the Bay Area have level of service F. So if your goal is driver delay, this is what you get. But if your goal is economic performance, you might get something different. So something happened in, in 2008, you know, this is, these are conversations that we've been having in this sort of realm for a really long time. Um, Jeanette Sadek Khan uh, took over as a transportation commissioner in the city of New York under Mike Bloomberg and immediately began sort of drastically redesigning and re-envisioning streets. Now New York is uh, somewhat lucky, they have these huge wide uh, one-way traffic sewers um, that travel through sort of their avenues and so they had a lot of space to play with. Um, kind of like another place that I could name. Um, and they had, uh, and what they did is to, is to try and reallocate the space. And not only reallocate it, but uh, break the, throw out the rule books and try something completely different. Um, and that is to provide true protected space for people biking, to provide true dedicated space for transit, um, to provide frequent crossing opportunities for people on foot, um, and to re sort of rejigger the amount of crossing distance that you'd have to experience as a person walking. So this was a huge revolutionary act when they unveiled these street designs. And not only that, but they did them really fast, almost overnight. Um, many of them using temporary materials. You can see most of this is paint, right? So uh, uh, normally if you were to put a project like this in concrete, you'd be looking at a 10-year sort of project delivery timeline. You'd be looking at $30 million. 
but they just kind of went out and did it overnight. Um, and, and not only that, um, but they spearheaded an effort um, with the National Association of City Transportation Officials to come up with a new recipe book. So these two books, the Urban Street Design Guide and the Urban Bike Design Guide, were like permission slips for cities to innovate. So for such a long time, cities had been beholden to those books, the, the sort of guidebooks that I showed you at the top of the presentation. These guidebooks actually laid out, well, so how wide does this buffer need to be? And what's the merge sort of distance here? And, and should we use yield, yield marks here or not? And what's the width of the parking lane if we do this? And how wide should this be? And what should the timing be on the, the transit priority signals? And not only that, but there was an explosion of cities doing these kinds of designs. So there was this huge latent demand to try something new because what we had been doing had not been getting us to the outcome that we wanted, either in the number of people biking and, and walking or uh, their relative safety and, and chance of, of being injured while doing so. So in, if you pick up these books, there's pictures from you know, Austin, Texas and Memphis, Tennessee and you know, DC and Chicago and Portland and Seattle. Um, there's just been an explosion of these kinds of designs and in a new approach to treating streets as a living lab. So the other thing that gets in the way of innovating, particularly if you are a transportation engineer, is the concern about liability and your main sort of fear of, of somebody getting hurt, right? That, that there is a very high bar for anything you put in the public right of way. So having, so, so sort of trying something out, um, doesn't feel safe, doesn't feel comfortable. But if nobody tries anything new, uh, we'll never get to a better outcome. So these guys were really powerful in helping to provide some of that courage and protection. Um, and the other interesting thing about NACTO is that they were really trying to establish a peer-to-peer -peer learning kind of uh, environment. So you have Salt Lake City, you have Charlotte, North Carolina, you have Atlanta, you have Austin, all of them trying these things in different ways and all of them learning from each other about how to deal with ADA requirements, how to design these in accessible ways, how do you do one of these in front of a, a loading zone or a valet zone for a hotel, all of these things that we were working out with each other in sort of real time. Um, and California, you know, wasn't really that far behind. I mean, we were, um, as we always have been, leaders um, in, in sort of rethinking these things and taking risks. Um, and so there's, you know, you can see there's, there's reclaiming streets as public space in Los Angeles and San Francisco, um, protected bikeways in Long Beach and Sacramento. So this is really, you know, the punchline is that, you know, up until probably, I don't know, 10 years ago, these were really the dominant ways that we measured the success of our streets. But now these are all of the things that are being asked of us in transportation. And to deliver these things, we need a fundamentally different playbook um, for how we both deliver projects and in how we measure them and talk about them. So what does that mean for Los Angeles? So you know, here's the, the strategic plan that we uh, put out probably in October of last year. It establishes several benchmarks. Um, this is sort of what we're trying to get to. These are the mayor's sort of pillars of what he wants uh, all of the city departments to be working towards. Um, and I'll point you to a couple of, of things. So first, uh, you know, I did a survey of, of my 1,800 or so staff uh, the second week I was there. And one of the things I asked them was, do you understand how your work every day relates to the, the agency's mission and vision? Um, and the answer was sort of what mission and vision? Um, I'm the eighth general manager in the last 12 years. And that huge revolving door of executive leadership has meant that everybody at the staff level does not have any faith in management's ability to get anything done. Uh, because there has not been consistent leadership at the top and there's been no clarity around what our sort of uh, priorities are. So we established them. So the vision, um, the, the main words here are sort of choices. Um, and these are the outcomes that we're trying to get. Uh, the, the plan is, is sort of divided around these four themes. And the very first thing you encounter on the very first page is a call to get to zero traffic deaths by 2025. It's a, a brand, sort of a, a, a goal uh, sort of known as, as Vision Zero. It's been adopted by New York, San Francisco, Chicago, Seattle, Portland, uh, and other places as well. Um, there's movement on the federal side to establish a Vision Zero goal as well. 
And when you look at the people who are dying just trying to get around town in Los Angeles, about 40 to 45 percent of them are people walking. Uh, people walking and biking about three times as, as likely to be involved in a severe fatal crash, and the costs associated with those are three times as much um, as, as a driver. So we're moving in that direction, and we hope to get there soon in terms of an executive directive um, and a real plan for how the city is going to achieve that. Uh, livability and sustainability. So this is a lot of things are parked here, including launching a bike share. Uh, hopefully by about a year or so from now uh, in downtown, and hopefully you'll have some stations here at SC uh, and, and Hollywood as well. Uh, this is the place where we talk about improvements to the DASH system and Commuter Express, um, the place where we talk about uh, how we're going to design really 21st century streets. So what does that mean? So first of all, it means we need to refocus uh, street allocation towards transit. We need to look at bus rapid transit where uh, hopefully delivering a project on Wilshire, uh, looking at doing something on Vermont as well. Um, this is uh, Cleveland. Uh, Cleveland, ladies and gentlemen, has a fantastic world-class BRT corridor. We have one too. The orange line's not too shabby. Um, these are uh, sort of some of the street types, some of the, the, the sort of bikeways types that we want to include. This is the Indianapolis Cultural Trail. This is Polk Street in San Francisco. This is the Panhandle. You see the bike signal here uh, um, right alongside the, the traffic signal. Um, reclaiming street space as public space, particularly unused or underused space. Getting to Vision Zero, more organized streets. This is the MyFig project. Um, this is what Figueroa Street will look like um, in, in the not too distant future. Um, and then we need to get better at talking about outcomes. Why are we doing this? What are we measuring? Why does it matter? Um, so getting into talking about injuries um, as well as uh, sales tax revenue and those kinds of things um, in addition to just are we getting more people biking and walking. So the reason why we've been so bad at sort of telling our own story is that we really didn't have a lot of data. Um, and in transportation, we're really good at talking about how much, how many, how fast. Um, but we haven't been really good at talking about the other outcomes. So this is work uh, that was done in, in San Francisco, mimicked, uh, so very similar to work done in, in New York and Portland, where we looked at eight streetscape projects of all different types. So everything from a, a road diet uh, to just a simple plaza improvement, and, tried and looked at uh, retail sales tax data to try and understand if these projects had a negative, positive, or neutral effect on business. And the punchline is that on seven out of eight of these uh, streets, uh, the businesses either kept pace with or outperformed their neighborhoods and the city at large for the same period of time. So there's something going on here that we don't fully understand yet, that when we make these kinds of improvements, businesses benefit directly. And these are local businesses. This is sales tax receipt re returns for, from local businesses. Uh, no big boxes in there. And that uh, the, the sort of difference is somewhat significant. So it takes about a year to see sort of the return on that investment. Um, it's anywhere from 5 to 12 percent in terms of uh, the, the improvement in performance compared to uh, their competitors. So this is a headline from the Los Feliz Ledger. Um, this, I don't live too far away from here. And this is a, a story about a, a, a restaurant that opened called Squirrel. It was one of Bon Appetit's top 10 new awesome American restaurants. It's really good. They have an amazing tonic, if you haven't been. Um, I promise I, I was not paid to say that. Uh, they, they, uh, and they opened, and, and then, you know, here's the, the, the headline is that, you know, Squirrel opened, and now all these new businesses are opening right around it. Um, but something else happened about three months before Squirrel opened, and that's that we did a road diet and put in a bike lane um, on this same corridor. So we have to get better at telling our story. If I'm doing my job right, this doesn't say the squirrel effect. This says the road diet effect. Um, and every sort of local business in town is going to be interested in getting some of that same magic um, to see the same kind of return. So there are other things that are, that are coming, that are here. Uh, the city has a, a sort of a, a car sharing pilot launched. Uh, we're bringing in bike share. There's um, scooter sharing. There's, uh, you know, uh, private shuttles that are, that are coming with the arrival of tech in both downtown um, and parts of the west side. Um, and there's a real huge opportunity here for Los Angeles to skip a step. 
um, because I think that the way that this story is going to play out differently in Los Angeles has a lot to do with the intersection of, of transportation and technology, and it also has a lot to do with the intersection of transportation and the arts. So, you know, the other thing that's coming um, is not uh, Scrabble in cars and cocktails, but driverless vehicles, right? So this is the future we were all promised in the 50s and the 60s. Um, driverless cars will definitely be on the streets of Los Angeles in the next one to five years. And our question and challenge as a city is, how can we have the shared use economy and driverless cars rise together so that people buy services and not vehicles? Because there are two vastly different ways this could go, right? If Google has their way, um, you know, you'll have a, a 25 mile an hour small vehicle, sort of good for urban mobility, excellent for safety. It will literally not allow you to get into a crash. It won't need a parking space. You don't need massive parking structures anymore. We might not even need parking lanes. Um, and it sort of circulates around and takes people to and from where they want to go. Um, and, and you all, you, you pay for it and you order it and, and all of that just through your smartphone. The other way that this could turn out is that, you know, companies like Audi um, and m maybe Mercedes and Volvo are really more interested in re-incentivizing auto ownership. So getting, you know, there's been a huge downward trend in vehicle miles traveled, auto ownership, people delaying getting their driver's licenses. But if you have something that's, that's basically the equivalent of an iPhone but for a car, um, you know, you've kind of, maybe you've got a shot at turning those trends around. So there's a huge role here for leadership and regulation from the city level on up to the federal level um, and some interesting questions to see how it all plays out. Because Uber is playing for all the marbles. Um, this is their uh, $10.7 million day. Um, right before this, taxi trips were at an all-time high in the city of Los Angeles, higher than, th than they'd been ever. Um, and then, you know, two quarters later, they were lower than they were before the start of the recession. Um, and that's because Uber launched uh, on in, in December of, of 2013, and you can see Los Angeles um, immediately took notice um, and has become the second largest market for them. You know, we've got 100,000 uh, trips being completed um, on every week in Los Angeles in Uber. So you can see how people are already sort of wanting to not drive their cars, but how do we sort of make sure that that transitions into a driverless vehicle world? So a little bit, uh, you know, I mentioned the other way that I think it's going to be different in Los Angeles is because we're the cultural capital of the world. Um, and the way that we bring arts and transportation together will really, I think, set um, a new tone for the way that people think about spaces and public spaces and transportation in cities. So, you know, last August we cut the ribbon on this project on Broadway. If you haven't been there, go take a look. We took a lane of traffic away um, and we gave it back mostly to um, public space. We gave it back to people walking um, to help support Grand Central Market and the Ace Hotel that had opened up and all of the things that are starting to fill in that gap. Um, it was immediately, um, you know, part of the Ciclavia route. Um, and then we used it to do an, an event called Pop-Up Broadway where we had, you know, old out-of-use uh, marquees being used by the city's poet laureate to put up poetry, drop-down murals, adorable children. Um, and, and, you know, we can take those things and push them even further. So these are pictures from uh, Copenhagen. Um, which has already started to really bring artists into the room when they're doing transportation design. Um, so you can see this is a park, this is a bike lane, um, you know, this is a play street, uh, this is in front of a, an elementary school that's also near a dead-end street, um, and it's literally a place that you can play um, anytime you'd like, and the cars can make it their way through, but they are guests, right? And the people using the, the play structure are are really the main folks that it's designed for. This is the one-legged soldier in Odense. Uh, the Odense is the birthplace of Hans Christian Andersen, and he has a, a famous fairy tale about a tin soldier who lost his leg. And this is traffic calming, right? And the, the closer you get to it, the more you learn about it. Each of them has a different number. Each of them represents a different soldier. These are the kinds of things that make us fall in love with cities. Um, and they represent a new and really interesting approach to kind of the traditional materials that we use um, that invite people to come closer, to linger, to spend time with each other, um, which is really sort of one of our primary goals. 
So with that, I'm going to finish my part of the presentation and invite Jeremy up. Salita and I go back a little ways. Uh, we worked together at Fair and Piers uh, about a decade ago for a little while, and uh, we've known each other for a while. But um, I've got a few sort of lines of questioning based on what we talked about Salita presenting today, but I'd really like it to be interactive too. So my role as a discussant, I asked what exactly is a discussant, um, is really to facilitate here. Um, but one of the interesting um, lines with art in transportation and art as a piece of the design of the actual treatments that we're putting into the roadway, um, which I think is a really powerful idea, uh, one of the challenges is that the people implementing these things like to have a playbook. And, and in some cases, they need to have the playbook, right? And the playbooks are changing a little bit, but um, those playbooks don't say what art is okay and which art is not okay and what the parameters should be. And they, that's a totally different lexicon than a typical civil engineer's training or a typical highway capacity manual author's mindset. So how do you see that evolving? What, what's the next NACTO guide look like for art and transportation? Or, or how do you see that evolving? One of the things that made me think about it is that this move towards using temporary or interim materials. So when you look at Broadway, you can see, you know, we've tried some different surface treatments there. We've got planters, the people streets, you know, we just um, sort of rechristened uh, Sunset Plaza and Silver Lake. We've got one that opened in Lamert Park. We've got one that opened in North Hollywood. Um, and they're all using uh, temporary materials. And you can look around and see in different cities, all of the cities are trying to do something similar. And to me, they're just exceptionally ugly. I mean, the People Street ones are nice, right? We've done a good job, but we could be doing such a better job. So there's this um, old sort of story, and I don't know how much truth there is to it, but it used to get passed around by our <laughs> mutual friend, Matthew Ridgeway, which is that San Luis Obispo in the late 90s tried to, wanted to experiment with traffic calming, this crazy idea, traffic calming, mini traffic circles and speed humps and all kinds of things. And they were like, yeah, fine, but you can only use temporary materials. You can try this crazy kooky thing out, but only use temporary materials. So they put a bunch of stuff out there and they used cones and they used paint and they used other stuff. And it was so unattractive that people in the neighborhoods like came unglued you know this is our beautiful neighborhood and now it's it looks like a construction site and what were you thinking resulted in a really long moratorium on traffic calming period yeah. um, which i think gets to something important a lot of these spaces need to be maintained and cared for in order to remain good spaces and the only way that people will do that is if those spaces are beloved and the only way a space is really beloved is if it's beautiful so I think of it as like a sustainable maintenance strategy to make something more beautiful and more enjoyable, more, uh, you know, something that you have ownership over. It's hard to have ownership over a three foot plastic bollard that, you know, has a reflector, right. piece of reflector tape White on it. Shiny. Right. right. <laughs> I mean, it's nice when it first yeah. goes in, yeah. if you're into that kind of thing, but then over time, you know, it just becomes this huge burden on the city to have to go out and constantly maintain those kinds of things. Yeah, and we didn't used to design things that way. I think, you know, in the design profession in general, if you look back to the turn of the century and the middle part of the 1900s, the City Beautiful movement and our architect and designer friends were much more engaged in the transportation industry. And if you look at bridges as an example uh, of those expressions of real civic pride and civic art and infrastructure as a designer's canvas. Mm -hmm. I think one of the unfortunate outcomes of our austerity and our lack of investment in infrastructure is uh, people have lost a shared civic commitment to investing in a way that would return those higher quality public spaces. And you know, we're, I, when I look at it from the outside too, I say the city of LA has massive resources, right? Like, shouldn't they be able to do something phenomenal with these spaces? Mm -hmm. And we get polka dots, you know, right. or like, which, you are, know, cute. which are great, so you know? Cute. Um, but I, I, I think there is a, a pent up longing for better quality infrastructure and better quality design and better quality art. But this also works in tension with our willingness to fund that investment. And unfortunately, as cities 
we maybe haven't done as great a job of delivering that quality, so we've lost some of that confidence. And it, taking risks. I mean, risk taking and innovation have to go hand in hand. People need to be able, you know, those those you know well-intentioned efforts in in San Luis Obispo would have been great if the leadership had said, "Hey, we get it. They didn't. You don't like the way they look, but right. we're getting some good outcomes. So how about we try it again, but this time with feeling, and this time we do it, you know, with a little bit more." panache and a little bit more of an eye and we let the neighbors pick the curtains and we find I mean there's this sort of fantastic thing going on in Portland and Seattle called intersection repair mm -hmm. where neighbors come out and they actually in residential neighborhoods create murals in intersections and they're sort of these really interesting little traffic calming devices because as you drive over them first of all you sort of feel like I'm driving over art is this right is this the right thing um, but second of all, you want to slow down and look at it. And if you've got kids in the car, they want to see what it is. And the neighbors themselves are now invested in keeping it. It's a reflect, direct reflection of street as true front yard and public space for the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So kind of getting to the, but, but that project violates, I don't know how many rules. Lots of codes. Yes. Yeah, in the MUTCD. So somebody had to take a risk and say, no, this is a good idea. Let's try it. Let's evaluate it. And then let's talk about it around outcomes, around safety, speed, you know, how many people are walking there and those kinds of things. And community happiness, which is something we're not really good at measuring yet. Yeah. Road diet, could you uh, tell us what you mean by that? Sure. So um, that's where you, when you take a look at a street, right, so um, it, it has certain components to it. It's been divided a certain way uh, whenever it was built back in the day. And then over time, um, it might have changed or not. But, but pretty much, you know, the way that we size and design streets is not as scientific as maybe we were promised. Um, you know, a lot of times easements are set in development agreements. And then, you know, they, they go in and they stripe streets, but maybe they have a little bit of extra asphalt that they weren't planning on. And so they might add some additional turn lanes or something like that. So when we come back in and we take a look at it with a different policy frame and with a different sort of, uh, with the motivation of, you know, how can I create a safe street? How can I create a street where, you know, I bring the number of injuries down or where I improve the sales tax returns for the businesses on that street? You might divide it a little bit differently. So you would take a look at the number of vehicles on it and the number of lanes it has and decide, is it overweight or is it the right size? Um, and if you decide it's sort of overweight, you put it on a diet by removing something. You take away parking lane, you take away a, a lane of travel, you take away a turn lane. Um, you do something to sort of shrink the size of the street that's available for people driving. And then what you do with that space is pretty much wide open. You could create bike lanes with it, you can widen sidewalks with it, you can put in a median with it, whatever sort of tax with what your goal is for the outcomes of that street. Some people like the term road diet, other people really don't. Uh, and some people who are objecting to it say, well, it's, it's not a problem that the street is fat, it's a problem with what we're doing with the street itself. So let's talk about what we want out of the street and let's, let's say this is a people street project, right? So this is a DOT uh, approach. Uh, Let's not talk about these as driving lanes or parking lanes or bike lanes or sidewalks. Let's talk about them as streets for people. And then how are people using that street? How would we like them to use that street? How much of the space do they need for that use? And, and really thinking about it more in terms of its functionality. So the diet folks say, oh yeah, we should stop widening streets. We should stop making them fatter. But that's only part of the challenge. Once you've made that choice to say, we really can't maintain or continue to build wider spaces for people driving, um, even if we just stop widening, there's still a big endeavor uh, and, and choices to be made about how we reallocate that space or what we do with that space if we're going to reshape it or, or rethink it. And, and then you get other folks who are saying, no, it shouldn't be about people streets, it should be about living streets because mm -hmm. isn't the environmental function of the street and its ability to capture and retain water and, and filter and what about habitat? Wow, we, we have trees, we gotta maintain those trees, right? We need, we need songbirds on our streets. Butterflies. Butterflies, mm -hmm. bugs, bunnies. I am an uh, entomologist, right? So, That's right. Uh, so, there's, the, the language matters, I, I think, is, is a key takeaway. And yeah. so you mentioned in your uh, presentation about we haven't done a great job of selling these things or really talking about our outcomes, even when they happen to be really good. Uh, and even when we are doing a good job, um, I think we're getting better at that. I think People Streets is a great example of 
you know, reminding folks that streets are for people, they're not for cars. And many great urbanist thinkers have said, if you design for cars, you get more cars, and if you design for people, you get more people. Um, and, and there is this tension. So um, road diets bring into, into view one of these tensions between the through movement and the need to connect people across long distances and the place component of streets. And, and sort of, even when you see this play out in practice for things like the Great Streets Initiative, why isn't every street in LA a great street? Why, uh, why not all 7,500 miles of streets in LA? Um, well, we got 15, which is a good right. start. But how do, how do we make those place versus, you know, destination versus connector choices? Uh, how do you see that playing out in, in practice? Well, sometimes I think it's a little bit of a false choice because I think that there's a general agreement that a street that has just two lanes in each direction, two through lanes in each direction is maybe one of the most poorly organized streets in an, in an urban context because when you can introduce a turn lane for drivers to get out of the flow of traffic and pull over to turn, you see a huge drop in the number of rear end collisions. You see um, a big sort of, uh, it, you might even see an improvement in the actual through capacity of the mm -hmm. street because you've organized it better. To me, that's kind of the name of the game is how can I get to a street that's organized so that it has breathing room, it has flexible space for different things to happen at different times of day, right. but also it has predictability and it's organized. So everybody sort of has legitimacy and space on the street. Mm -hmm. um, to your question about network versus place, uh, I am pretty strongly in the place camp. Mm -hmm. I think for a city like Los Angeles, um, a citywide network doesn't make a whole lot of sense for almost any mode. I mean, I think most of the trips, for example, that um, happen in the South Bay, like 70% of them originate, they have their origin and destination in the South Bay, they never leave the South Bay, right? And yes, we have these sort of long distance commutes, but that's not what the street system should be for. And we don't really need long citywide networks for people biking, we definitely don't need them for people walking, um, and I don't think you even really need them for transit because we can, we can accomplish that, you know, that's really should be accomplished in, in subway and sort of rail infrastructure. So we have to figure out how to strengthen our neighborhoods. That is going to be the thing that is going to reduce the number of the amount of traffic on our city streets. Um, because the more lively and resilient your neighborhood is and the more you use other modes for short trips, the more space will be freed up for people who have to drive, um, particularly as our sort of demographics change. We have a lot of older adults that want to age in place. They have a lot of care providers um, that need to get to them and from them. Um, and, and so we need, there's a real sort of equity need to free up street space. And I think something like a quarter of all of our trips are shorter than five miles or three miles or something like That's that. A substantial number, yeah. So that's perfect bike distance. It's pretty good walk distance. Um, but if we're providing safe and organized exactly. streets on which that's you right. feel comfortable as a maybe interested but concerned cyclist right. to actually get out there and try this, that you're not having to fight through what you perceive as a really unsafe environment. Mm -hmm. So good question on road diets. Others? Up to this point, the Great Streets uh, initiative has been relatively vague. We know what the streets are, but we don't know what the actual treatment's going to be on the streets. So the first question is how how does how does this all this policy get translated into reality? And then similarly, uh, how do you work with DCP and uh, the mayor's office and the council districts? I mean, how, how does that all come together to sure. implement something? So the department um, in the strategic plan um, sort of uh, volunteered to take the lead on five of the Great Street segments. Because when I, when I got here, I sort of felt like the mayor established a Great Street studio. It's got some really smart, talented people working in it, but they're not implementers, right? They're good at convening people. That's what the power of the mayor's office is. But they don't, they're not engineers who have designed a ton of streets. They don't have field crews. They don't, it needed a implementing agency to kind of step in and take take over for a few of them. So those are um, Reseda, Central, Hollywood, Venice, and what's the one I'm forgetting? Van Nuys. So I think you'll see in the next, and they're all at really different places in their planning and outreach process. 
Some of them, like Venice, we just kicked off the Venice outreach process. Jeremy is helping us with that. And the whole goal of that was to show up with absolutely no agenda. It was really important for that particular community in Mar Vista to have no whiff that we were there to do anything, do anything in particular, right? We're, that we were, were 100% open to listening, right? So, but then on Central, uh, we're having a community meeting there in April, um, and the council office direction was, this is a community that has been visioned to death. Please do not show up and try and create another plan and ask them for their design goals and yeah. do dot voting. No, come and tell them what we're going to do and then do it. And so, and we're trying to bring the same sort of um, short-term temporary approach, pop-up event approach to redesigning Central. So those are two wildly different approaches to engaging the community. And as the community goes uh, to certain degrees, to varying degrees, so goes the council office. But um, Los Angeles is a really interesting place in that um, in San Francisco, there are, there's too much planning going on, right? The, the county transportation authority has transportation planners. Uh, city planning has transportation planners and urban design studio and all of that. Uh, MTA has transportation planners. Everybody thinks that they are in charge of transportation planning for the city of San Francisco. Here, it's almost the opposite, right? So there's really good long range planning happening. Like uh, what is a 30 year streetscape project, which is, you know, to, to pour Broadway in concrete is $30 million, probably 15 years to really see that totally permanent. Um, so the council offices end up playing that function. And I think that uh, they have big staffs, they have transportation directors, they have planning directors. They are in office for at most 12 years. So they're filling in this gap of short range transportation strategy work. Um, and so that's something that I don't think people fully understand. And when I see these low voter turnouts, um, I think there's a lot of lot big conversation we could have about that, but part of the problem is that I don't think people really appreciate. And a key difference here is that those, while they may have staff, they don't always have big discretionary budgets. Okay. So in other larger cities like Chicago, some of their equivalents, the aldermen, have budgets every year, some on the order of a million dollars, to do transportation improvements. If that's what they want to do with their general fund money towards transportation and you see a lot more tactical things happening than piece by piece and you know your council district is now delivering some really great temporary short-term low-cost New York style and well I, I better get on the stick over here because you know my neighbor is doing right. great things so it, when I forget how many aldermen they have but I think oh, it's something in the 90s a lot like I've, a little under 100 yeah right okay for a city the size of Chicago we have 15 council members for a city that you could fit, you know, seven or eight San Francisco's into. Their council districts are bigger than most California cities, both geographically and in terms of the number of people that they serve. So they really are like, and what they say goes in their district. And so my approach to working with them is that I wanna do great things with all of them. I wanna help them achieve sort of their, their dreams for what they wanna see in their streets. But there are certain, you know, I, I want to look for the ones that want to take big risks, that want to try big things um, to try and support those efforts as much as I can and hopefully seed them and watch them grow around the city. How do you uh, see the relationship between the complete street and uh, the priority street? Because I see in some community plans, they, they embrace the idea of priority street. So they create a street instead of, instead of uh, a street for all users, but they create a street. They give priority to certain kind of users, such as like pedestrian pri priority street or the transit priority street. Uh, to me, I think the later one is more feasible because uh, sometimes you have to face like the budget constraints and historical preservation. So, do you think that these two concepts are conflict? It's a good question. I, I think they have been in the mobility element for the city of LA. Um, the city of LA is un undertaking, and you talked about long range, uh, good job at planning. The Department of City Planning is, is leading with help from DOT. Um, questions of that same nature. And when we started the Complete Streets Act here in 2008, we're required to include uh, policy language, but we wanted to sort out what does that mean? Does that mean all streets need to accommodate all modes and 
What does accommodate mean? Uh, and, and I think one of the other documents that came out in a similar time frame uh, from the Institute of Transportation Engineers, from the industry you know, side, was a document called Planning Urban Roadway Systems. And in that document's recommended practice, uh, another idea was presented called layered networks. And it was presenting more of this concept that if we try to do everything for everyone on every street, we end up doing everything just okay, even at our best day. And if you think about the best streets for transit or the Orange Line as a transit way or the best streets for bicycling, the best streets for walking or congregating or Hollywood, um, having at least some of our streets designated as most important for that mode or most important for those types of connections uh, does have some merit as well. So we presented those options to the community in, in uh, FP or in, um, in, uh, in Think Lab sessions and, uh, and a lot of community outreach. We went out, we made meeting in a box things for neighborhood councils to discuss and debate about this. And um, what we started to hear from communities is that they said, yes, there are certain streets that we would like to have a higher priority for people walking or there are certain streets we'd like to be very comfortable for riding a bike. Um, bicycle facilities in particular are very hard to deliver in a really comfortable way. If you think about an off-street path where you can ride for maybe five, ten miles without crossing more than one or two intersections, uh, those don't exist in many communities. LA's got a pretty good off-street class one uh, facility network, uh, but it's, I used to work in Denver phenomenal, follows the waterways, almost all crossings are grade separated. Uh, I could ride from my house in southeast Denver to downtown Denver, which is about an eight mile ride, and I, I crossed one signalized intersection at grade. Everything was until I got to downtown. Um, it's next to impossible in a built out environment to recreate those. So our choice then, if we want to attract the riders and families and elderly folks who might not be comfortable riding even in a bike lane, uh, is we need to find some other way to give them added comfort and protection and safety in the on-street network. Well, to do that in most of our streets in LA requires a pretty radical reallocation of space. Uh, some of them are really wide and we can do that, but oftentimes that's only for a handful of blocks or a short distance, which maybe doesn't provide those connections. So I think there is a fair bit of tension there. Um, the way the LA to B plan is shaking out, they've got about 260 miles of cycle track network envisioned for the city of LA, which is massive compared to almost any other city of our scale. Uh, they've got about 300 miles of bus only lanes uh, included in the plan as well. Um, and so those are, of the 7,500 miles of streets that we're talking about, a relatively small number, but if you flip it the other way and say, well, how many miles of cycle track is New York or San Francisco doing? You say LA's got 265 miles planned on the books and we start layering place specific great streets initiatives, long range protection of these are the streets we agreed would be good to work toward uh, a very protected and comfortable network for bike or transit. And you start to get uh, what could emerge as, as a very powerful network, not just place. So. In San Francisco, you can look at the grid and see, you know, uh, Valencia is really a street for biking, you know, Mission is really a street for transit, and then you've got Guerrero and South Van Ness, which are really uh, for throughput capacity for people driving. And if you're driving, you don't drive on Valencia because those signals are timed for bike speed. They're timed for 12 miles an hour. Um, in so that if you're on your bike, you never catch a red light, but if you're driving, you probably catch one at every single um, every single signal. So there's a way to sort of, if you have a grid, that you can sort of start to look at how different streets can serve different functions in that grid. But having said all of that, there should be a safety lens that covers every street, right? So, you know, every street should have sidewalks, every street should have compact crossings for people walking, um, every street should have a speed that's appropriate to the kind of mix of users that you're going to see on that street, regardless of if it's really, you know, just a throughput for vehicles or if it's really highly prioritizes transit, um, because people should be able to walk comfortably and safely on any of those streets. Well, it's a great point about speed as well, because a lot of complete streets has been about infrastructure, but I think the safety discussion in Vision Zero is much more about speed. And that's another thing the city of LA is actually leading the dialogue on. 
uh, the LA to B plan has a target operating speed identified for uh, all the street designations in the city. Most places are relying on the 85th percentile speed and our traditional playbooks say, well, what should the speed be on that roadway from a design perspective? Well, go see how fast people are driving. Mm -hmm. That's how fast it should be. When the city of LA is saying, no, wait a second, uh, this is an environment where we want it to be slower speed. We want 20, 20 is plenty on, on, on a lot of these streets. Why can't we have that, um, Salida? You know, why can't we have that, uh, Caltrans? Uh, why can't we have that? And, and right now, our playbooks don't give us a very good answer. So the approach LA is taking is to change it at the general plan level and the circulation element level and say, this is what we want. We're going to change the filter here that we're using and it's land use context sensitive uh, and network sensitive. Is there another metric that is not as narrow that could be used or should we move away from it's a good question. So, you know, there's different ways of putting this. Some people say you get what you measure, you measure what you treasure, what gets measured gets done. There's a million different sort of truisms about it. And the idea is that if, if you measure for cars, you get more cars, right? So, um, and that's the way that in, at least in the California Environmental Quality Act has been the pr predominant way that we communicate the impacts of, of development projects, period. And we have not done, it doesn't allow you to communicate benefits, it doesn't allow you to communicate across any other metric besides how many more cars, right? Um, and how much longer are you gonna have to wait in your car? And what that does is make it easier and cheaper to develop on the outskirts of towns where there isn't a lot of traffic and where you can build brand spanking new wide streets for no money and makes it really expensive and difficult to develop inside cities where one additional car trip might trip a level of service trigger and require you to you know, do something that's pretty distasteful from a policy perspective. So office and planning and research, so there's you know, a, a Senate bill that was passed to change the way that we do that. Office of planning and research at the state level is trying really hard to get to something like vehicle miles traveled per capita. And that the goal would be to reduce, if you use vehicle miles traveled per capita, your goal is to reduce the vehicle miles traveled, which means that you're incentivized to do things like subsidized transit passes or charge for parking or any of the things in the, in the playbook in the menu that we know reduces the amount of driving, right? And then you get a different outcome and actually it's really easy to develop inside cities because cities already have, you know, people who live in cities already have really low uh, numbers of vehicle miles traveled. I mean, both Hollywood and downtown already have almost a 50-50 split between single occupant vehicles and everything else in terms of how people are getting around. Um, and I know that uh, Jeremy probably has a few things to add. I, I won't add a lot, but there are, you know, pedestrian environmental quality indexes, PECI and bike environmental quality indexes, and the Highway Capacity Manual 2010 has a bicycle LOS methodology and a pedestrian LOS methodology and a transit LOS methodology and updates to the vehicle LOS methodology. And there is something real about the public's appetite for a letter grade. And so, you know, it's easy to fight a project if it's creating something that has an F on it. <laughs> You know, uh, and nobody wants an F, right? So um, some of the modal advocates have said, well, we have our own scale, and your A for drivers is F for my pedestrians, so who wins? Um, if we don't give folks a scale, if we don't give them some way to articulate and simplify what can be a very complex and convoluted at times um, set of metrics and measurements, streets are very complicated. There's not one thing that streets are supposed to do. It's not like a water pipe. It's not like an oil transmission line. It's not like an electrical grid. It's supposed to do lots of things well, and different streets are supposed to do different things well. And so one of the challenges is that we want a metric that applies everywhere, but we expect different streets to be better in different contexts. And if you had to put a letter grade on what's the most memorable street you think of when I say what's a memorable street, how would you grade that? But we all have streets that we remember because they have qualities that were memorable. Um, so if you ask me one, one, cont you know, one metric, is your street memorable? If it's not memorable, you're probably fine to drive through, right? You're probably fine to not think about it and 
you know, don't worry about it. But if it's going to be memorable beca because it's your front yard and it's where your kid was born, and I remember growing up on that street and I remember playing in that street, that's a much different quality. Or, or you know, I kissed my wife for the first time right there, uh, you know. Uh, those memorable qualities are very hard to quantify, but, but they are important to people. And, and we need to do a good job of providing some simplification to what's a very complicated question. So the OPR guidelines are going to talk about VMT and how to measure report. Um, scale matters a lot too. Um, I think LOS right now is segment or intersection mm -hmm. and projects are evaluated by their trip generation but what's a project and how big is a project and VMT is really calling that into question in a much bigger way because if you look at the net VMT effects of LA being the way it is, very polycentric and infill development happening, we look really good. If you look at VMT in a much narrower context or in a rural context, you say, well, you're developing way out in Palmdale. Well, if you're developing in downtown Palmdale, it's a lot different than if you're developing 15 miles outside of Palmdale from a VMT standpoint. And, and so those contextual scale uh, questions for VMT are going to become much more important than they have been on the traffic side of the LOS question. Um, and it's, it's a real challenge for practitioners right now. In the changing economy, the, na the nature of the economy, that be uh, consumers are purchasing more goods online and the projections is projected to skyrocket uh, mm -hmm. in the coming years, the amount of goods that are, are shipped. Um, in all the talk about complete streets, uh, freight is very rarely mentioned. In New York, when they implemented their plan, had a terrible time with delivery trucks, parking in, in bike lanes, parking in the middle of the street, blocking traffic flows, um, because they have a specific delivery time during the day that they have to make these deliveries. How do you see, with the changing nature of uh, the consumer economy particularly, but you can talk in a larger frame about freight, especially the Forster right down the road here, and the amount of freight that needs to come through there. How do you see that fitting together with uh, kind of your vision for LA uh, in the longer term? So I don't know of any city that's done a very good job of coming up with real urban freight mobility solutions. I mean, I think from a Vision Zero perspective, um, these are this is a, a, a sort of pool of professional drivers. They're sort of some of the best drivers that you're going to see on the streets because this is what they do for a living. However, when the crashes do occur, they're much more likely to be severe or fatal because of physics, you know, a, a truck versus a person. Um, and so there's a real, I think, from my perspective, I mean, freight, freight movement um, is something that we need to figure out specifically, you know, working with the port. And that's something that we're looking at, uh, that we have in our strategic plan is trying to come up with some real sort of solutions for, for sort of, uh, you know, getting in and out of the port. In particular, after the slowdown, they've got a huge backlog that they need to clear um, of container ships. And transportation has a role to play there. Um, actually, the... Um, the sort of Los Angeles is looking at trying to get some funding from the federal government around connected vehicles and vehicle to vehicle um, technology for freight specifically to get into to deal with the goods movement down and partnering with Long Beach and, and Los Angeles. Um, so there's a lot to be done on sort of overall movement. But I think that when a lot of these drivers got their training, it, the streets looked really different. You didn't see you didn't come downtown and encounter you know, buses and people walking and people biking. And so there's a real need to sort of do two things, I think. One is get the distributors to the table and talk about how we manage time of day deliveries because there's a huge resistance to doing that. How do we concentrate deliveries in certain parts of the city and specifically downtown um, that can sort of, uh, where the street can serve a different function for that part of the day if it's needed. Um, and then how do we push education out um, to the drivers and really actually think rethink the, the vehicle design itself. So cities of Boston and New York have both put in requirements that a lot of these open wheel trucks have truck guards on the bottom of them so that uh, it's impossible to, to, to capture a bicyclist or a pedestrian underneath the, the truck itself. Um, so there's a whole huge sort of bucket of, of things there I think that you know, uh, that I don't know of any city that's doing a fantastic, like there's, there's really not a role model. So that means there's leadership vacuum and we could, uh, we could, we could sort of take, step. yeah, skip a step, take the lead. Um, but I, but it would require some real partnership and, and collaboration from groups that have not traditionally uh, wanted to come and engage with cities, the railroads. So the question is sort of about the equity of transit service that we provide to different parts of the city and also, 
you know, the further out you get from a, a, a given center, the less attractive and the less time competitive transit is. And so, you know, how do we can how do we sort of um, continue to to sort of uh, offer people real choices when they live in transit poor parts of town, um, or when they have to live um, in in a neighborhood because it's where they can afford to live, but their job is you know in the downtown center, and you know that gets into a whole nother set of solutions that we have to talk about, which is about wage equity and about the jobs housing mismatch and about affordable housing. I mean, those things are all fundamental to solving a lot of our biggest regional transportation issues. Um, but to the, in the short term, I think the thing that we have to be mindful of is that the private sector is gonna try and fill in that gap, right? So the same kind of disruption that we saw for taxis with Uber and Lyft is definitely coming to transit. You know, there are at least three or four companies that I can think of that want to provide the equivalent of super shuttle on demand all the time for, say, $5 instead of $175, right? And I think that while that is potentially a good, and, you know, you see Uber and Lyft both going into the carpooling business where they're, they're providing, you know, Uber pool and Lyft line where you can, for five bucks, you can ride from Santa Monica to downtown um, if you can be matched with somebody else who wants to take that same trip. I think that the risk we run when we start to go down that path is in creating basically two classes of transit riders, right? The, the folks who can afford a $5 transit ride and the folks who can't, you know? So I operate Dash and Commuter Express. A Dash fare is, is uh, 50 cents. When we double, and we just recently doubled it, right? It was a quarter. <laughs> um, and when we did that, we lost riders because it is a true lifeline service for uh, the sort of working poor and very low income in this city. And if we, if we make it so that sort of middle class folks uh, now can pay a little bit more to have a sort of upgraded transit experience, who's going to vote to tax themselves to improve the basic fundamental trunk line service um, that we're now building on the backs of, you know, Measure R and federal grants and a whole lot of other things. So it's... Uh, these are real choices that we have to think through and the privatization of public transit and if that's a good thing or not um, in terms of providing, in terms of equity and you know, what is the role of government to subsidize some of those trips for folks uh, because it is gonna be, I mean right now, Uber is dirt cheap. I mean it costs nothing, right, to ride now. for now, right? And, and right, they're gonna go public and it'll all change and whatever. But, in the meantime, uh, you know, it's, it is uh, not expensive to take that, um, take that form of transit. So there's a lot of stuff to unpack there. And when we talk about the shared economy and we talk about bike share and we talk about car share and we talk about all those things, we have to talk about equity. I mean, we have to. There's, those things kind of have to go together. But there aren't really a lot of easy, direct answers. And again, this stuff is also new, that cities are playing catch up and nobody is stepping into a leadership role. So it's another big opportunity for a city like Los Angeles. And I would just add, I think it depends on your expectations for what you want from your city government and what you want to have the private sector deliver for you. And there are pros and cons, right? And it depends on your political persuasion probably, but it, it's, it's a fundamental thing that for so many years we've taken for granted that cities are meant to provide infrastructure for us. If we ask the private sector to provide infrastructure for us, they know how to do it. And those contracts are really big. And if we're not savvy about that, we end up with beltways like the one around Denver that have 99 year leases and started out at $5 for one trip. Now it's $12.5 for the same trip, less than 10 years later. So, you know, price certainty uh, is an important thing that not many people think about or value in terms of. I'd like Salita's department to provide that service for me, or no, I'm cool, I got a phone, and I'm, you know, I'm just, I, I, and think about your kids. If, if you have a kid, I, we still have vehicles in our household because we have to go different places on the weekend. Am I gonna let my son ride with an Uber driver at what age? Uh, I will let him ride the bus at what age? Um, it's different calculus, right? So one is a professional driver, one is a known organization, uh, one is a new driver, also professional, also subject to some background checks, you know. 
So those, that's, those are new challenges for us to think through, but um, that degree of control and influence that we're ceding to different parties is something we should be mindful of. And a lot of times when I do that driverless car spiel, what I get in response is, well, the market's going to figure it out. Market's not going to figure it out, right? I mean, it, it, it isn't. If I, let, if I let Volvo figure it out, it's going to look really differently than if I let Uber figure it out, which is going to look differently than if I step in and maybe the city buys a huge fleet of Google cars and I operate the digital dispatch, right? right. And that's a whole different model, right? So these are all things that we need to be thinking about if we don't want to play catch up because governments are very, very poor at playing catch up. And you can see that playing out around Uber and Lyft. Well, let me thank both Selena and Thank you.